Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's 
So uh, a little bit of impromptu start here because we're missing a moderator. So I am your guy. Um, <laughs> I kind of been thrown into this situation, but uh, it was so nice to start off in a good way like that with some singing. And uh, of course, the prayer this morning by uh, Patsy Paul Martin, Elder Patsy Paul Martin. Um, so I just wanted to start off by introducing our speaker, first speaker this morning, uh, Fred. Uh, are you the first speaker? Or? Jolyn's the first speaker? Okay, see, this is, this is what I'm dealing with. I don't even... Um, let's see. Jolyn. Well, Jolyn, I know. Um, but I will read her bio because she took the time to write it, and it's very impressive. So welcome, everybody. Uh, Jolyn's presentation today is titled uh, Building Up From Zero, and uh, she'll be presenting on um, her work in Medicine Hat. Uh, Jolyn is a National Newspaper Award nominee and Métis writer, penning the Mwasin Moment column for Medicine Hat News, an Indija Finfluencer, which is an Indigenous finance influencer, um, and um, she's the creator and facilitator of uh, Métis Money, Ma Money Moves, uh, a new personal finance and budgeting basics course. So if anybody's interested in Métis Money Moves or any sort of program related to budgeting, talk to JoLynn, she's your woman. Um, JoLynn is also an Indigenous Housing and Homelessness Advocate, keynote speaker, uh, the recipient of the Métis Nation of Alberta's 2023 International Women's Day Award and Career Development Award. She is Anaso, Anaso Kamaki and uh, in Cree, one who provides care uh, or aid. Uh, she's passionate about the community, collaboration, and exploring one's heritage and raising her voice for good. Uh, jo Lynn's work is, is breaking down barriers to lift up individuals, families, and the entire community. And Jo Lynn also works with us on the National Indigenous Homelessness Council as a board member and does a lot of great work across the country representing the Indigenous voice through reaching home uh, with her, her community entity in Medicine Hat. So, without further ado, welcome up JoLynn Parento, your first speaker today. Marcy, Shane, that's tremendous. How are we doing for sound, everyone? Okay, beautiful. Well, Bumatem, Yunakishkatu, Jalasi, good morning and welcome to everyone in the room and across Turtle Island joining us online. Marcy Mon, my gratitude to the CAEH team for welcoming me to speak with you all today. Jolin Paranto, Dishinikashan, Niakishchi, Temiyoyan, and Limachifuyan. My name is Jolin Paranto. I'm a proud Metis woman and auntie daughter of Doris, granddaughter of Tina, daughter of Lawrence, granddaughter of Ambrose Peranto, and I'm pleased to share with you my journey and vocation. I'm honored to be a visitor here in Jibuktuk, the Great Harbor, Halifax, in Mi'kama'ki, the ancestral and unceded terry of the Mi'kama'a people. For over 13,000 years, the Mi'kama'a have enriched the fabric of this land with culture, history, stories, and spirit. My wish and our collective work here today is for today's Mi'kmaq, all Jibuktuk's people, and all our relatives and neighbors across Turtle Island to be safely at home in their community of choice. Dans la ville la Michin de Chapu Niwikin, I'm visiting from Medicine Hat, Alberta, nestled in Treaty 7 and Treaty 4 territory, traditional lands of the Siksika, Gainai, Bigani, Stony Nakoda, and Sutina, including the Cree, Sioux, and the Soto bands of the Ojibwe peoples. I also live and work on the homelands of the Métis Nation, represented by our newly elected Otepemnesawak Alberta Métis government. Rivière de la Paix, Guinita Wikin, my story begins in the small community of Peace River in northern Alberta in Treaty 8 territory. Ni Mama Doris, ni Papa Laurence, Shini Cacho, I was raised by my belle mère Doris, a beautiful, hardworking French mother, and a Metis Cree father, Laurence Peranto, former brawl writer, great storyteller. When we think about home, do we need four walls, a community, a homeland, or all of the above to give us a sense of belonging and a feeling of security? Growing up, 
our family moved around often, and I followed the same pattern as an adult, moving through 20 homes in my first 36 years. Looking back on my childhood through an adult lens, I recognized my mother working 12-hour days as a small business owner, and my father changing jobs many times. As an adult, I would label these townhomes now as low-income housing, but I recognized two of them as childhood homes in different years, holding many memories. Changes in income, family structure, cost of a living, and loss of sense of safety have all been catalysts for moving house many times in my life. At 18, I moved to Amasquatchee, Wiskigan, Cree for Beaver Hills House, modern day Edmonton, on Treaty 6 territory for college to pursue my inherited gift of storytelling in broadcast radio and television. That led to work in community relations as a way to connect to others. But in my directionless 20s and most of my 30s, I never felt secure enough to put down roots. For years in Edmonton, I rented cramped apartments, a single room, basement suites, moving every six months to a year, often in a panicked hurry. At the time, I didn't recognize this pattern for what it was, housing insecurity. I buried the short but frequent periods where I wondered, where will I live? For many years, I continued to search for my forever home, and in doing so, I would identify my reason for being and my purpose. In 2018, I my journey brought me to Medicine Hat, a fresh start in a sunny, bustling River Valley community like Peace River in Edmonton, where I planned to adopt a quieter pace of life. <laughs> With a relatively lower cost of living, for the first time I could rent a charming little two-bedroom bungalow with a yard and a garage all to myself, what felt like a real home for the first time in many years. At the same time, though I'd lived away, from my Métis side of the family for a long while, I now felt a deep call to connect to my native cult culture, perhaps to search for my purpose. I reached out to my local Miasin Friendship Center to reconnect to my roots and find a new vocation. Miasin is a service delivery agency targeting the needs of Medicine Hat's urban indigenous community since 1996, providing trauma-informed counseling services, cultural and recreation programming for all ages, meals for elders, traditional parenting, and well-briety programming. Miasin runs heritage events such as demonstration powwows, culture and language camps open to the public, which are welcomed and well attended. Below market affordable apartments occupy Miasin Center's second and third floors. Miasin also owns a single family home to keep families together in 2021, made reunification possible for a single parent with a large family. We can create welcoming spaces that say Tawau in Cree, come in, you're welcome, there is room. In these many ways, Miasin serves to lift up indigenous hatters so they may live healthy, purposeful lives at every stage. Miasin Datushkan, the Miasin Friendship Center, opened their doors and hearts to welcome me, and it is there that I have found more professional and cultural fulfillment than I could ever have imagined discovering. <coughs> First hired in November 2020 into a COVID support and family liaison role providing food security and resource referrals, in May 2021, Miasin was awarded a contract for Reaching Home, Canada's homelessness strategy, a program of the federal government with a dedicated funding stream for Indigenous homelessness. As Alberta's first Indigenous homelessness community entity, my role transitioned to implementing coordinated access, building this new program to connect our unhoused neighbours to new homes and the resources families need to thrive. I adopted a new Cree work title, Onisokamakyu, one who provides aid. In this work supporting our community's urban indigenous population, most are looking for kiskinotawewen, guidance. Niwichawak, so we help them on their journey home, whatever that might look like for as long as it takes. We are especially concerned with supporting those experiencing long-term homelessness and facing housing exclusion. Coordinated access is being implemented across Canada in communities large and small, a network of community partner agencies that cooperate to work as access points, open doors for individuals and families experiencing or at risk of homelessness to get connected to the right supports and housing services quickly through warm referrals and follow-up. Coordinated access key objectives are to help communities ensure fairness and prioritize people most in need of assistance, to help more people move through the system faster, to reduce the number of new entries into homelessness through diversion programs, and to improve data collection and quality. 
the framework and concepts for coordinated access were being explored and developed in Medicine Hat over a decade ago before it fell under a federal umbrella by Medicine Hat Community Housing Society. They wrote the script for what would become Reaching Homes Coordinated Access. One of Alberta's seven cities on housing and homelessness, Medicine Hat is one who coordinates local plans at a systems level and aligns funding resources for greater impact and progress towards ending homelessness. In June 2021, in the midst of a pandemic that threatened the lives and livelihoods of so many, Medicine Hat became the first community to achieve the Canadian Alliances to End Homelessness's Built for Zero benchmark. This touchstone qualified our city's social services as adequate to provide unhoused Hatters with the shelter and supports they needed in short order. Medicine Hat had reached functional zero, defined as just three individuals experiencing chronic homelessness for three months. At that time, Medicine Hat's night shelter was nearly empty most nights. A seemingly easy time for me to be hired into my housing and homelessness navigator role, I thought. And in the beginning, I was able to offer plentiful one-to-one -one support to each individual on my caseload. Since then, Medicine Hat's unhoused population has been exacerbated by a trifecta of crises, a continually rising cost of living, long-term impacts of the pandemic on mental and physical health, and for some, an increasingly toxic drug supply. More than 1,600 Albertans lost their lives to drug poisoning last year, and this year, up until August, 1,350 more. Come September 2022, a year into my new role, Medicine Hat conducted our point in time count, meeting 120 people that evening, experiencing a mix of sheltered and unsheltered homelessness. One in four identifying as indigenous, an overrepresentation five times that of our general indigenous population. Though many social issues might be broadly attributed as the fault of the homelessness response system, there are community care spheres of responsibility that fall under the umbrellas of policing, the municipality, and health services, such as bylaw infractions and crime, public restrooms and parks and public spaces, and addiction, mental, and public health services, respectively. Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness President Tim Richter has acknowledged that though Medicine Hat has seen its success in reaching functional zero homelessness rolled back, we are rallying our community and will get back to functional zero, benefiting from well-coordinated homeless systems designed to be responsive to changing conditions that in the face of all this hardship, there is resilience, hope, and progress, and I thank him for his encouragement. I do not have a social work background, but I am a helper and a problem solver. In building Miasin's coordinated access program, I began with conversation and a few questions. How can I help? Where do you want to see yourself? What are your expectations of me? Our reaching home program is called Natamuskakoin, a Cree word meaning a place to come for help, shelter, or resources, a teaching developed by Betty Edel, Director of Housing Supports at End Homelessness Winnipeg, and supports people from many walks of life. Most are unhoused or precariously housed for a variety of reasons, changes in family structure, a rising cost of living, and a loss of sense of safety, the very same reasons I moved so often in my younger years. By finally acknowledging my own lived experience, I could relate. The people our team serves knows their needs best. Most are looking for assistance with a private market rental search or applying for subsidized housing. But if they don't have income to support a rental, we start there, applying for income support if they're unable to work. If they don't have a bank account to receive these funds, we start there, supporting participants in selecting a bank and helping navigate checking account options. If a person doesn't have identification needed to open a bank account, we'll assist with a referral to ID clinics in town. Sometimes we work backwards to move forwards. The Reaching Home program allows for immediate interventions and long-term solutions for people facing homelessness, including street outreach, shelters, day services, and housing. We understand that to truly assist, both financial and non-financial supports are necessary. Non-financial supports provide the helping hand that is often pivotal in determining whether an individual can get back on their feet, such as assisting accessing income benefits, housing searches and placements, and life skills development. 
Miyasin takes supports further in offering access to traditional foods and medicines, social and community integration, and recreation center access for families, and can still be expanded in many ways. Tenant supports, rent-ready workshops, connection to Indigenous elders' guidance. This new program roadmap and expanded slide deck is available as a template for any agency interested in a visual guide for how to implement coordinated access or a holistic housing and supports model in their center. Of course, there are real challenges outside one person's control. At times, a growing wait list equal to a current caseload means folks are referred back to community housing for supports, or if they choose to wait, some fall out of touch or move on to the next city. Highway 1 runs through Medicine Hat, making our city a travel corridor between provinces to the east and warmer, larger centers like Vancouver and back again. Often our unhoused population is transient, but our urban Indigenous citizenship is growing too. Miasin Friendship Centre aims to meet the needs of all who connect with us. Our frontline team hopes to grow to include more helpers. Some who connect for assistance are not in a place where they are committed to succeeding or not well enough to pursue success, even with supports in place. This reality results in folks dropping contact after connecting for supports. The most disheartening challenge is facing blatant racism or prejudice from private landlords when income support is disclosed as a primary source of income who will outright refuse apartment viewings to those people on government assistance because they, quote, won't take care of the property because they aren't paying for it themselves. Too many suitable um, private rental listings now often say suitable for working people right in the property description. In our Community Foundation's new Vital Signs report, more than half of our respondents agree that racism is a problem in our community. One in five Medicine Hat households spend 30% or more of their income on shelter. A third of our citizens are renters, but the vacancy rate is less than 2%. As they say, the struggle is real. To combat these challenges behind the scenes, I also lend my voice and experience to the National Indigenous Homelessness Council, a citizen advisory committee which advocates for supports for federal prison inmates before and upon their release, and the Medicine Hat Police Service Chiefs Indigenous Advisory Committee and other roundtables working on solutions. In a 2022 report, our National Indigenous Homelessness Coordinator, Shane Pelche, had this to say, and I echo his sentiments. The great sense of purpose I feel for this endeavor, our mission, the vision of us all sitting in circle together, working hard to care for the people out there, and in turn caring for one another. The example we can set for this sector and for the world, who so desperately need our gift of community and unity, this is what drives me to show up every day and represent us in the best way possible. Medicine Hat has built strong collaborative partnerships between many local community agencies. Cooperation is the key to holistic, organic, coordinated access, success for our participants. The community housing team is made up of patient, capable staff who understand that a caring approach goes beyond filling out forms and assessment tools and offers warm referrals to each individual who identifies as Indigenous, often teaming up with us to provide supports. Collectively, we housed 300 individuals and families last year. Housing resource workers fill an essential role in successfully matching unhoused individuals and families with private, affordable, and subsidized housing, providing life-saving supports and serve their communities well. The Women's Shelter provides emergency and transitional housing that is no longer gender exclusive and recently introduced a text line for when a phone call can't be made safely. Alberta Health Services Lynx House provides shelter before and after detox. A harm reduction and intervention team visits Miasin to treat those who can't find a family doctor. A nurse practitioner can provide medical notes required for income support applications for individuals who are temporarily unable to work. They provide addiction support, referrals to detox and treatment, harm reduction supplies, wound care, STI treatment, and testing, and prescriptions, all on a walk-in basis. The Mustard Seed operates a wellness center that provides a breakfast meal, laundry service, clothing and hygiene supplies, assistance with obtaining ID, counseling and health care services, as well as operating Medicine Hat's overnight shelter with 30 spaces. 
churches and thrift stores provide furniture. Our local library has a cash employment program. Canada is experiencing a 78% increase in food bank use. In Medicine Hat, more than 11,000 households accessed our food bank last year, nearly a fifth of our population. The Root Cellar is Medicine Hat's rebranded food bank, now set up with store shelves so folks can pick up a basket and shop with dignity like a real grocery store, as well as operating a community garden and 12-week food first cooking class upon completion, gifting participants with a freezer and a crock pot. In these ways and many more, we as a coordinated network of community agencies are meeting the wraparound needs of those we serve. Coordinated access is not designed to address emergencies. If someone is in crisis, they're connected to support workers who can assist in addressing those immediate needs first. I commend our frontline workers for serving with care, grit, and patient professional hard work. The Canadian Observatory on Homelessness describes our program succinctly, that Indigenous service providers offer a holistic approach to service delivery and coordinated access that is based upon trust and relationship building. Wikiwin is a Cree word meaning home, housing, a sense of belonging. I received this teaching from Cheyenne Grayeyes and Selena Vipond of McEwen University in Edmonton at last year at Toronto's CAEH 22. It is our goal and mission to offer Nata Muskakawin a place to come for help, shelter, or resources so that all who connect with us can feel supported on their journey to find Wikiwin, home, housing, and a sense of belonging. In our first two years launching Indigenous Coordinated Access at Miasin, nearly 100 individuals and families have connected with us for housing search supports. Housing insecurity persists in Medicine Hat. Many of the people we serve are our peers. Perhaps if I'd experienced more trauma in my life, I would be in their shoes. Twice we've helped expecting moms get the keys to new homes just a week before baby arrived. And we've helped an older gentleman flee a gang hostage situation with a safe new apartment. A first year housing success rate of nearly a third can be attri attributed to collaboration with partner agencies, relationship building with landlords, and our program participants' active engagement in their journey to home. It is important to remember, however, that each person has been on their journey long before we arrived, and they'll continue on their journey long after we're gone. We are only walking alongside them a short time. I thank Betty Edel for that teaching, which provides some comfort when individuals inevitably drop out of touch or reject our offer to help. Many of our community members are still on their journey home. For some, home finds, means finding safety inside four walls to call their own. For many Indigenous people, it is also reconnecting to culture. Family and land lost the legacy of residential schools and our ancestors' displacement onto reserves. Early on, I got a phone call from a single father. He told me that he couldn't afford bus fare to take his daughter swimming. Could I help? Well, isn't that my purpose? Our city operates a fair entry program that provides subsidized access to rec centers and kids' education camps for low-income earners, but transit wasn't part of the program. So I put together a proposal to illustrate how sponsored bus passes could connect under-resourced hatters to what matters most, supporting the health and wellness goals of families with no other means of transportation with access to appointments and activities. We've, been, we've seen that lack of transportation can hinder clients from accessing ongoing in-person programming and appointments and jeopardize their ability to maintain their commitment to receiving supports. Providing low-income families with access to public transportation will help foster physical activity, which leads to better overall health. People could also see their doctor, get to school, work in the grocery store, and access social service agencies like Mias and Friendship Center for supports. Within weeks, the city responded with launching a new transit subsidy pilot, expanding my proposal to include five community agencies, sponsoring 50 individuals and families with bus passes for three months. Imagine the joy of the single father upon hearing his simple request to take his girl swimming, meant many families would now also have the ability to do so and much more. Pilot participants were surveyed on how having equitable access to transportation makes connection to community resources attainable and makes a difference to so many. In February this year, 
Transit joined the City's Fair Entry Program for all under-resourced hatters. Do not doubt the impact your efforts to help others can make. I'm also passionate about personal finance. Maintaining housing can be difficult without responsible money management. As a reformed overspender, <laughs> and as an Indigenous person, I feel it is my responsibility to share my knowledge for the benefit of my peers and the next generation. In January 22, I created and launched Métis Money Moves, a budgeting basics course to help individuals and families make change for the next seven generations. I developed this new course in response to Miyasin clients continually requesting financial support for rent and utilities arrears, despite their income typically being adequate to cover these basic expenses. Participants learn how to calculate and track income, expenses, consider debt payoff strategies, build savings categories, and provides tools to find motivation to make change in one's money story. In my course, we discuss how our personal relationship to money, how we were taught to handle it or whether we had it at all, if it was controlled for us or if it keeps us up at night with worry, shapes our individual and generational money story. The class includes some Indigenous history teaching as it relates to money and generational trauma affecting family money stories. Since the program's launch, 70 individuals and families have gained the tools to take control of their household budgets. Feedback has been consistently positive and the course is growing with demand. Community agency partners like the Mustard Seed and others have hosted me in their centers with the course easily adapted for a general audience. I may be the first Indigenous influencer, Indigenous finance influencer. Another rewarding endeavor is a return to my media and storytelling roots. For the last two years, the Medicine Hat News has held space for me to amplify Indigenous voices and success stories in a column I call the Miyasin moment. Miyasin in Cree means it is good, so it is a good moment when you read these stories over your morning coffee. I write about history and tradition, events alive with culture, music and healing, and human stories of success, creativity and resilience, ingenuity, <coughs> community, and the wisdom of knowledge keepers. The human stories shared introduce hatters who are making a difference. First Nations and Métis entrepreneurs, artists, helpers, educators, and advocates. Sharing these cross-cultural moments in this way with non-Indigenous readers broadens mindsets in our community and has been well received. Connection to culture is medicine. This truth isn't limited to Indigenous peoples. Sharing a traditional meal or celebration with others of any mutual heritage fosters belonging. Our steps are lighter when our healing journey is shared with others. In addition to Miyasin offering sharing circles, language camps, and events that honor our heritage, in the summer of 21, some of our team formed a traditional drum group, learning Anishinaabe healing songs from YouTube, sewing our own ribbon skirts, making our own drums. And from, we come from all across Northern Turtle Island, Canada, and from different backgrounds, family makeups, and generations. We are Métis, Anishinaabe, Cree, Blackfoot, and together we are learning to raise our voices in a good way. My role now has involved to include more advocacy, networking, and speaking platforms, program development, and cultural knowledge sharing. I've been a part of podcasts, Pecha Kucha, a published book, media promotion, and many a PowerPoint presentation and in the last year have been nominated for the National Newspaper Awards, Medicine Hat's Community Spirit Awards, and received the Métis Nation of Alberta's International Women's Day Award and Career Development Award. All of these experiences and endeavors sound like a lifetime's body of work, but it's just been three years. When we're dedicated to making meaningful change in the world, it stokes passion, inspires action, and injects powerful significance into our work. A clear purpose guides people through change and motivates them to lead from wherever they are. I feel lit from within and called to help, to give back for all that I have received. I'm looking ahead and leaning in, asking how I can better serve my neighbors, learning from my professional peers. At Miyasin, we hope to be role models for our peers and the next generation. I'm joining a new generation of knowledge keepers, but even our elders say we are always learning. In closing, my message to the helpers in this room, you are all Onasokamaku, one who provides aid. Kamiu etush konowau, you are all doing a good job. Stay connected to one another, continue to share best practices, keep your hearts open to serving your communities, 
We connect to help one another, and with every new project and person I meet, there are new stories to tell. I believe they are all stories of hope. We hold in our hearts a shared vision. All that we are learning will strengthen our efforts to build a future where homelessness is brief and rare. With determination to find solutions at every level, we can see an end to homelessness and a way to weak you in, belonging for all. Nimiyutan in kikitutan, it's been nice talking to you. Marci kinanas gomitin, ekipei totukanush. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Jolyn. Just getting the presentations, the rest of the presentations loaded up on the computer. And next, uh, we have a presentation called Housing First Collective Approach Exploring Maori. And excuse me if I say this wrong, uh, Pacifica, yes, okay, Pacifica, a Indigenous Ways of Tackling Homelessness in New Zealand. And uh, we have, do we have three presenters for this? Is, am I right? So Fred, Estelle, Judy, Mat uh, Mataya, and Heheitu Barrett. Yeah, did I say that right? No? Uh -uh. Um, I only have one bio for uh, Fred Estelle, and he's the head of the Maori Development and Education Vision West. Uh, he's the, sorry, the Vision West Director of Kaupapa Maori Surgical Translation Research Team, or STAR for short, at the University of Auckland. And um, Fred, is your presentation on here? Is that what's happening? Okay. So once we get Fred's presentation up, I'll invite Fred up. Actually, since we're, we run a little bit over on time, but maybe I'll invite Fred up now, and he can uh, bring us into the next presentation. Thank you. Maye <coughs> I tenet me here to get a koto at the Hokainga Tato e we Quakarangi have my neck a mato Tene ope out the aroa or make more Hurino, get a koto, naivi taki taki ke or the motifanu Tenet me here to get a koto, tena koto, tena tato katoa Kota prita monga, waikato tiwi, waikato te awa. E uri nei au a te kingitanga, a e hoa, aroha hoki o tēnei tōputanga Housing First Meki, ko Fred Esto tuku ingoa, tēnā koutou katoa. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Fred Esto. I'm going to wing it. Wing it like I sing it. I'm going to wing it. This is about a conversation that you and I need to have. This is about a conversation that is dear to our hearts. This is about a conversation that is Māori and Pacifica, that is Mick Moore, that is Jolin, that is Peace River, that is Yellowknife, that is Pacifica, that is Hawaiian, that is First Nations. This is the conversation that you and I need to have and have it of a nice flat white. Wonderful to be with you all. I'm just an opening act, Fano or family. I'm just an opening act. Because with me are two of our most dynamic Māori and Pacifica leaders that are here to share their story because they are leaders leading in this space. 
of indigenous solutions in Aotearoa, particularly uh, here in the most populated homelessness area in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Auckland City. So we come all this way not to be silent. We come all this way to sing. We come all this way to connect. This first slide is really about talking from our Matariki stars tradition, where one of those stars is Hiwa Itarangi. Hiwa Itarangi represents our hopes, our dreams, the things that we aspire to. So the stakes are too high for us to dream small. Agree? Good. It is time to dream big dream bold and get on with it. It is time. The time is now. We've heard it from our rangatira, our leader, PM, McMore Friendship Centre, which we had the privilege of, of eating wonderful salmon, hearing all these wonderful stories, being blessed by the different prayers last night of the elders. It is time to dream big. And you heard it from the leader, PM, this morning, McMore Friendship Centre is about to take off again. So this is our family. This is who we are, the Housing First Auckland Collective. They look beautiful, don't they? Yeah. This is our organisation. This, this is um, uh, our gathering together. First time since, since COVID, since the lockdown in New Zealand, we were able to get together, I think, about three years. I just really want to acknowledge these organizations, our staff, our specialists, our leaders are here. That's why I'm just an opening act today, Fano, family. I'm just an opening act because I'm going to hope and to try and sit down and, and, and get our huge, huge influences in this space their time to share what we're all about here. This is about our reimagining the continuation of our journey. We launched this my year, Tai year, as our strategy for the future. This is about us. Thank you to the Backbone team, Rami, Clariel, for providing us with these slides today. This is our vision. I'm not going to read it over there. That's for you to take it in. And I think it's a vision that we all share. As you can see, this has been our journey. And as you can see from the rapid rehousing, we've got a lot of work to do. So that's what I'm saying. The stakes are too high, it's time to dream big and dream bold. I want you to take notice of that 54%, because I'm gonna be zoning in and we're gonna be zoning on that 54 to 20%. In Aotearoa, Māori overrepresent we, all, we pretty much overrepresent in every other negative stats you can think of. Incarceration, health care, and so forth, poverty, and now homelessness. So what does that mean? Dream big. Dream what? Bowl. So. So what's the root cause of that 54%? So basically, if you take the land away from its people, you take everything else. You take the very essence of who we are. So landlessness, landlessness leads to houselessness, which leads to homelessness. So this has been due, and, and Pam and us agreed last night of the impacts of colonization, and she made us an important mention of that this morning because the impacts are real. Early, uh, at the very beginning of 2017, when we first got together, our job was to look at a bridge. How do we bridge a family, a young person? How do we bridge from rough sleeping or couch surfing to a, to a house? and into our home. But what does that mean? What are the things that we are trying to imagine together? How do 
we do it in a way that is authentic to us. And so from that came our framework. From that came the way that we are wanting to ensure that at the very forefront to our Māori, our Māori worldview, our Māori approach, and as Pam said again this morning, it's an, an indigenous solution led by indigenous people together with the whole collective. So, I'm just going to cut through all this. Now, and here, here are my solutions that uh, all of us are involved in. One is that we're not here for handouts, we're here for partnership. Let's do this together. The leadership that we provide together should be transformational. It should be strategic. It should be pragmatic, meaning we've got to get through the logistics of getting those dreams to eat so that we can execute them into reality. Agree? So transformational leadership requires pragmatic leadership also. And we can do this. And it's central to us because in accordance to the Tiriti of Waitangi, that that is how we become treaty-centric in our approach. So also, Rungwa Māori, and Jo Lynn has shared her experiences and her leading in those, where about this is really about our Māori health interventions, doing it what, what is authentic to us. This is my colleague, uh, Faye Pawisi, she is leading our Kopapa Māori trauma-informed care service there in Waitakere and Vision West. But she is just really one expression of what it means to lead an indigenous solution that, that is seeped, that is embedded in Māori traditional knowledge, Māori traditional practice and led by us. Also, home ownership. No longer do we want to see our people just be long-term renters unless they are really unwell and that may be the best milestone for them. If we can get them into owning their own home, then we are creating generational wealth. Agree? All right. I see a lot of head nodding. That's good. Your coffee's kicked in. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Love it. So it's about building personal economies. I'm, and also, the thing that is really dear to my heart is that I need information. I need it to help me inform what some of the uh, um, emerging trends that, that are kind of shifting, changing, and that are there. I need to see where we are, uh, are making the greatest impact and move on it. Why? It's because then I can turn that into a conversation with the government and say, as a partner, here's what you need to invest in, and let's do it together. And again, these are our collective uh, strategic objectives for us. And when you do this well, you get these kind of results. Thank you to our backbone team that, that feeds us this kind of information every quarterly. You do it well, as a collective, you get these kind of results. You get the services that are indigenous, you get the services that are there for every single person that comes through. And they are our collective solutions. Not really to find no, not bad for an opening act, eh? <laughs> All good. So I'm, I'm going to uh, get off stage and I'd like to introduce you to uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Judy Mataya. Ia lofa mai le atua, 
fatasi mai ma fesoso ani mai a wao le tato polo kalame. Te fatalo fatu i tangata o le fanua i nei. Fatfetai, fatfetai le afe fio mai, ma alo le soi fua, ma alo le soi fua manuia. O lo ingoa o Judy Mataia, o te sao mai le nu o sale moa, uh, my name is Judy Mataya. Um, born in Samoa, raised in Tamaki. Um, from my mother's village in Matatufu and my father's village in Salemoa in Samoa. I thought I'd better start with my mum's village because if she sees this online, she's going to say, why did you start with your dad's? <laughs> start with me. So um, I want to just start with an exercise for us. If you've ever been to a Samoan gathering, or an activity, or a festival, or a church opening, they will start with this exercise. So I'm just going to call on a few of my colleagues uh, to come. Hi, did I stand up? Um, this will require all of us to do something together. Oh my kulungai. Very simple, very simple activity. So when I say batia, that's just one clap. So synchronized clap. If you're not synchronized, go to the other room. We just want people with rhythm. Right, ready? Batia. Batia. Oh, you must be all Samoan. When I say lua pati, that means two claps. Lua pati. Lua pati. When I say, hey, hey, you say, ho. Hey, hey. Ho. Hey, hey. Ho. Patia. Patia. Lo pati. Now, I don't know why this was done in Samoa because we don't even have a buffalo. <laughs> uh, so when I say, tangi mele buffalo, you just go, ooh. Okay, just a, a, a little arch. Tangi mele buffalo. Tangi my le buffalo. Patia, patia. And when I say tangi my le tiger, that's tiger, which we don't also have in Samoa, but uh, <laughs> some reason we do. When I say tangi my le tiger, you say, Rah. Not, not a pusket, a pusket, a, a tiger, a tiger. Tangi my le tiger. Tangi my le tiger. Patia. Patia. Okay, this is the hard one. Hard one clap. Okay. When I say tolu tolu fa, that's, that's a, watch the claps. It's open clap, palm clap, open clap. So tolu tolu fa, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Well, one. Okay, we'll, we'll do it again. Ia. Um, so I know I'm going to combine it all together now, okay, team? <laughs> Are we ready? Are we ready? You've all had morning tea, so you should be ready. Okay. Patia! Patia! Lua pati! Lua pati! Tangi male buffalo! Tangi male tiger! Tol tol fa! Tol tol fa! Hey, hey! Thank you, team. Now you can say that you're Samoan. <laughs> You've participated in, in generally what every Samoan knows when there's a family gathering or a village gathering or sports gathering, because um, you should all be supporting to Samoa, just saying. <laughs> and fly the Samoan flag. OK. Um, wait, where's Clario? Clario, you, my, Clario's my timer. Cause Samoans need someone to keep the time. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just keep going. And I just want to acknowledge you, Jolien. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I just think there's some exciting things that we could all learn from. Um, and also from a reformed spender. My colleagues over here, they need reforming. <laughs> you see what they've been doing since we've been here. They're like, 
Where are they? They found another mall. They found another shop. Okay. I should be to stop throwing them under the bus. They're my wonderful mouth. <laughs> oh, yeah, wait, wait. They're next. They're next. I better stop it. Stop it. So I'm going to get in trouble. Okay. I wanted to start this presentation to uh, just talk about uh, the Pacifica experience. So when I use the term Pacifica or Pacifica or Pacific peoples or Pacific Islanders, it refers generically to Polynesians. Melanesians, Micronesians, and there's almost a hundred islands. But nowhere are we called Pasifika except in New Zealand. Everywhere else, I'm Samoan, New Zealander. But it's, it's helpful for the government to lump us into being Pasifika uh, for, for their stats. So, I wanted to start with these pictures. Um, my colleagues will understand where these photos have come from. Um, that's me and my dad, who proudly wore his Richmond Rovers Rugby League for the, um, the, the, the Masters, I think, back then. We, we along with so many other Pasifika families and Māori families, grew up in Greyland and Ponsonby, Hearn Bay. If anyone has been to Auckland, hands up if you've been to New Zealand, Auckland. Well, why did you put your hand up for? <laughs> You're from there. Um, you will all know that that main city centre, and actually where's, where's my sister that I met here this morning? She's amazing. She's one of you guys, but she's got a Samoan tattoo. I'm like, that's amazing. I don't even have a Samoan tattoo. Um, but this particular area in central Auckland was, was really regarded as the slums in central Auckland. Oh, buddy. But by now, nobody can afford a house in this region now. It's in the millions. And these are the houses that still stand for many Pasifika and Māori who um, first moved into here. So I'm one of eight siblings. Uh, three of us girls and five boys. Um, and now half of us call Australia home. Those wretched siblings, I don't know why they did that, but uh, you know, they, they call Australia home. But I want to just take you through the journey of Pasifika homelessness. One of the things that um, the elder this morning said in the indigenous language, there is no word for homelessness. There's no Samoan word for homelessness. Um, and so that's a really rare thing that we find ourselves in as Pacific peoples. Okay. So I'm just going to take you through the journey of the Pacific uh, positioning within Aotearoa. So it really starts around, around the 1940s. It's probably the earliest... Um, documentation of Pacifica peoples that moved to Aotearoa ar around the 1930s, 1940s. Māori hadn't quite moved into the urban cities. Um, and so while I want to take you on this journey of 70, 80 years in about two minutes, um, what I hope you will understand is where, we've, where we see ourselves now as Pacifica. So we moved into these urban centres, those of you who have been to Auckland, it is the Greyland, the Hearn Bay, the Ponsonby area. And it was because of those, those immigration policies, uh, it really did favour the white New Zealanders, the white uh, British immigrants. Really they wanted it to look like an outpost of Britain. And what many of you will also understand is the majority of the Pacific at some stage was colonised, uh, other than Tonga, I better say that, otherwise my Tongan colleagues will be like, no, no we weren't, we, we weren't. And Samoa was no different. Samoa came under uh, Germany, which many people don't know. Uh, Germany and the US had fought over, have I, have I done five minutes already? Okay. Um, Germany and the US had fought over Samoa 
and hence you, the US has maintained its position in Samoa with American Samoa. Um, the British had come in and moved the, the, Germ the Germans out and Samoa came under New Zealand law. What I want to just describe for you is the, these are the events that really happened. And most of us will remember our childhood where actually you knew everybody. You knew your neighbour. You knew what was happening. In the Greyland area, I was talking to one of my colleagues earlier, as soon as it was, as it was a particular time in the day, the aunties just yelled to the neighbour, who yelled to the other neighbour, who yelled to the neighbours to say, those kids at the Greyland Park, tell them to come home. And we all knew we had to just make our way back home. Um, nowadays, I ring my son, no answer, no answer, no answer. <laughs> I wish I had some kind of megaphone that could reach across. But this is what Pacifica people had left. They left the shores of the Pacific Islands, Niue, Tonga, Fiji, Tokelau, Tuvalu, the Cook Islands. The migration to New Zealand was, was large. So we fast forward now to 2023, and we think about, wow, now there's Samoans that are homeless. Wow, now there's Cook Islanders that are homeless. And so I think about what's landed us in these positions. And one of the things that Matu Fred had mentioned earlier was the displacement of land. Now, be, being Pacific Island, we, we don't own land in Aotearoa. But the house that we live in, the house that we plant uh, our taro in, the, the, where we make our umu, that's the land that we hold on to. That's the fabric of, of our society that has shifted and has now meant a massive population of our Pasifika people have become homeless. So what we're currently now faced with is that in Tāmaki, uh, which is Auckland, everyone say Tāmaki? Tāmaki. That's Auckland, in Te Reo Māori. See, you learn Samoan, you learn Te Reo Māori. Um, now we're faced with the current percentage of Pacific Islanders in Auckland, 44% are now deemed in these crowded, overcra overcrowded homes. One of the things that New Zealand uses is the Canadian uh, National Occupancy Standard that determines our, our understanding of, of overcrowding. And interestingly, one of the things that they deem overcrowding is if you have um, more than two people to a bedroom, you have single adults that are over 18, should have their own bedroom, you have children aged between five and 18, different genders should also have their own bedroom. I'm like, are you kidding me? Of course, of course that's not gonna happen. You, you, you have then families that move in together. If it's not overcrowding, they're in there for functional reasons. Actually, I'm gonna cook there. I'm gonna sleep in this room because I'm gonna save on my heating bill. It's easier for families to do that. One of the things for Pacific, Pacifica families is our notion of collectivism, our notion of serving the family, our notion of reciprocity and love and aroha. We expect the person to come to the doors when they're visiting the families to talk about these sorts of issues to demonstrate that. But when you don't understand the context of Pacifica alofa, Pacifica faalualo, Pasifika fatoi lalo, that the humility that comes with it, we all know. There's these power games that are played. And often the people that lose out will be our Pasifika families. They will be our Māori whānau in New Zealand. Um, oh yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna try and play this clip. What I would hope you would notice is have a look at who's actually doing the cooking. Have a look at where they're doing the cooking. 
um, and have a look at what they're cooking. Come on, assistant. Oh. Okay, don't worry. I was, it, was, it was just an, a demonstration of the younger generation. It was taken last month by some other cousins of mine. And we have the umu. In almost every Samoan family, you have to have a backyard that can, that can the men, it's the men and the boys, they do the cooking. They get up early, they go outside, outside, actually, they have their own kitchen outside, and that's where they start cooking. The Sunday big meal is what the men do. All of that's gone. If you're not devoted to teaching that and understanding that, you will also miss opportunities to understand the, the systems, the social systems, the family systems of Samborn families. So I want to just end with um, how much time? Am I done? Two, two minutes, two minutes. So what I want to show you down here is, Matua Fred had also mentioned this early. We, we really want to support our families. Uh, the Māori word for families is Fano, But actually that's not even a really good descriptor. It's so much more encompassing. And the Samoan um, notion of family so, so I'll just tell you quickly a story. So recently I had gone on a piano cruise, right? It was my eight siblings, my mum and dad, and all our husbands and wives and children. So there was 48 of us, 48 people, which is just, and that's my family. I would always include them as my family, not this kind of nu nuclear family system. And I understand that that's the, that's the same for almost every indigenous um, understanding of the family unit. You, you travel in groups, and actually, that's what we did in overtaking the P&O cruise, was all these Samoan and Tongans running around everywhere. Um, so what I wanted to, to just end off here is what you'll see is a state home. Now, one of the things that had started this conversation in New Zealand, and all of us in, in the working in social services and, so, and health and, and social housing in New Zealand will know that the, the very first house that was for state housing had massive fanfare in New Zealand, 1930s, the first state home. Amazing, clap, clap, clap. Let's, let's, let's put this in the, in the memory banks. But you know what was wrong with that, with that policy and to start off with? It didn't account for actually the working class. It was for our middle income, Pākehā, white, um, British families. So, that very first policy in New Zealand is probably what has led to this massive disparity that we have now. It did not cater for the, you know, the destitute, the vagrants, the drunkards, the drifters, um, the unemployed, Māori, Pasifika. It missed the opportunity to do that. And so what we find in New Zealand now is the very big divide of the deserving and the undeserving. So really what I want to end this conversation in, um, because it's time, um, is we want those opportunities. We want to be able to work with those, uh, th those of us who are in the sector, those of us who come with love and compassion and grace and care, but actually, what I want to encourage all of us in this room is talk to your whānau about dreaming big. Don't limit what they can do. Let them dream big. And for me, my aspiration for Pasifika is that we come back to home ownership. You know, transitional and emergency housing um, suits a purpose. But actually, if your end game is not to build the dream of home ownership somehow, um, then I'll be back here at another conference, still talking about how far we've still got to go for uh, Pasifika and Aotearoa. Um, I did want to just invite my non Samoan sister and brother um, to end in a song. Samara? Mara. 
and Leon. Um, so this is generally a song that's in Samoan that ends occasions like this. Um, for me, um, as the Samoan, with my non-Samoan brother and sister here who also know, um, before I hand it over to um, one of my amazing colleagues, hi, hi to. It is my distinct pleasure. We've got the closing act. How are you doing? All right? Uh, it's my distinct privilege and pleasure to introduce one of our CEOs here of our collective, likewise, Hi Hi to Barrett. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, ko waio. Uh, Tāroa te waka, uh, nā te whakaui te iwi, nā te kāringa te hapū, nō taha te maunga, te utehina te awa, te rotorua nui a kahu matamomoe, te moana, uh, te koutu te marae, um, ko Hai Hai Tu Barrett tōku ingoa. My name is Hai Hai Tu Barrett. I'm the Chief Executive of LifeWise Trust. New Zealand, and we are a part of the amazing uh, collective here on this Heidinger, on this journey, that have come over to share our experiences and working in the space of the Housing First program in New Zealand, Aotearoa. I'd just firstly like to acknowledge um, our host iwi of this whenua, tribes of this land, for safely having us here and assisting us with our travel journey alongside our ancestors and our tūpuna who have travelled with us spiritually to ensure that we have a safe journey because we're a long, long way from home. And we left last week, and I've actually lost track of the days. So I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> I don't know what time it is. I just know I made it here this morning, so that's big, that's kapai, it's very good. But um, I'd also like to acknowledge my um, presenting team that I gate crashed. I wasn't even on the co-papa. I mean, the, the agenda. But I'm more than happy to stand and help close our conversation. I'm known at home in New Zealand to be a speaker that never has a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm okay with that. I'm also known to be a speaker that speaks to the entirety of the truth around the work and the space that we do in assisting the development of pipeline, of mahi, of work, of hard efforts for the people we serve in our communities that have inherited a name called homelessness. Because in New Zealand, Aotearoa, that name was never heard of because we're from the land. We are the land. That is our land. We call it our whenua. We call it our pulse. We call it our heart. We call it us. It's actually the whenua that is standing here talking today. And it's the tangata, the person, who is the voice that is coming out of that land to speak about enough is enough, that our people are on the streets experiencing discrimination, being judged day in, day out, going through services doors, different services at different times, but never, ever meeting a result of tino rangatiratanga, which is self-determination, never meeting the result of positive solutions 
around being in a home that is wrapped around a connection of community, infusion of love and aroha, the basic concepts that we all know, that we all need to, to, to survive in a community of connection. Because a lot of the people that we all serve at this conference have lost connection with their own people, with their own spirit, with their own communities, and they are fighting day in, day out, just to be seen, just to be heard. When we arrived in San Francisco last week, we were very fortunate enough to be taken on a tour. But were we fortunate or were we disheartened? Were we challenged or were we traumatised around what we saw? Because the impressions of what we saw in the eyes of the people that were on those streets using drugs, going to the toilet, as we would call it, the restroom, right there in the middle of the street, right in front of us, without shame, because that became the normalised behaviour of the people that the public call homelessness. That became the culture that was not theirs to start with. It is what they have inherited from generational trauma and colonisation that we have all experienced as an Indigenous race. When we left San Francisco and arrived in Toronto, we were heartened because this whenua has a bit of a connection to us in Aotearoa under the Commonwealth. So we know we're getting closer in terms of the space of what we call Indigenous Native people. For us, it's a Tao Māori worldview on everything that we look at. So the connections and the solutions are not just from New Zealand. They're not just from United States. They're not just from Canada. This is a united approach of an indigenous stance that enough is enough. And we are coming here and we are making a stand because one person who is homeless is one person too much. If you have 1,700 delegates, if you have 1,700 delegates at a conference, we can make some change. If we are traveling across the world to meet each other in a thing called connection of brothers and sisters, we are wanting to make some change. Because the people that are out on these streets, for me in my hometown of Rotorua, they are my own family. They are my cousins. They are my uncles. They are my aunties. Sadly, some of them are our elderly. Sadly, and even worse, there are young people and babies. What has happened to us? We have lost our voice. What has happened to us? We are not at the decision-making tables. What is going to happen to us? We are finding our voice. We are going to be at the decision-making tables. It is conferences like this that we must make a stand, that we're not visiting anymore. We're coming to share knowledge. We're coming to impart knowledge. We are going home from this hiding, from this adventure, from this experience, connected to you, not as colleagues, as a united front of a movement that are going to make a stand for the people that it looked like, it looked at and discriminated when they're just trying to fit in, when they're just trying to breathe, when they're just trying to find love again. It's not that hard. These type of conversations are raw. These type of conversations, we heard something in San Francisco, can only come from the truth tellers. And the truth tellers are the ones that see the tangible of the trauma. Because the truth tellers cannot be silent anymore, cannot hide. We have to come out. We have to work in a collective partnership. We have to accept that everything that happened to us happened but it doesn't happen, have to happen again in the future. And it can't, it cannot. And home ownership is real. We've just got to come together to enable that pipeline to make it happen. Travelled earlier this year, and I want to acknowledge today in this whenua for the Indigenous veterans. I travelled earlier this year on a hiding accord, hiding a means journey the last man standing tour. I was privileged 
to travel with my tribe, and the last man standing is from my tribe. And he was a part of the 28th Māori Battalion, and they fought in Italy. And we went over, and we saw people from our tribe buried in a foreign whenua. We saw the last man standing visit each one of those gravestones and put his hand on his friends and his brothers that he had brought his people to see them. He had accepted that he was the last man standing, the last one at 98 years old. He brought his mukapuna, his grandchildren. He brought his elders. He brought his queers, the woman, the elder, elderly woman of the tribe. He brought his nephews. He brought his nieces. He brought his cousins because we had to experience that time. We had to feel that pody, that hurt. We had to go to a different land and not watch it or read it in a documentary. So we could return back to Aotearoa and stand strong as the descendants of those soldiers that didn't come home, that fought for another country, because we have to fight for our future generation to be able to stand on their own whenua in their own homes. And we have to do that in the legacy of our karoa, our elderly, our men that went to war and fought for the indigenous, fought for Māori, fought for the natives. We have to remember that we're here for a reason and it's not just about being in a provider or an organisation. It's a bigger picture. So our collectiveness and our commitment to ourselves and our people is us and we are here to do it. That's who we are as Māori, we're strong, we're fearless and that's who you are and that's who we want to be partnered with, that's who we want to be connected with and that's who we want to be in terms of our Pacifica, multiculture, everything that's happened across the world in the Indigenous space, let's come together and let's focus forward. Kia ora.
Q&A, but how could we possibly follow that? So if anyone has questions, I'll just say, I'm sure we have plentiful business cards. Please come see us if you're interested in the coordinated access roadmap or any other questions. Um, we'll mingle for a few. Marcy. 